This is my take on the Olympus OMD EM5 Mark II Micro Four Thirds camera. My immediate reaction on lifting the all metal camera from its packaging was that Olympus had sent me a camera shaped paperweight. It felt incredibly heavy and solid for such a small camera, with something of the bulletproof feel of a 60s Nikon F about it. Charging the battery and switching on showed that it was indeed a camera. In fact, it isn't particularly heavy at 470 grams, but it's a very positive first impression. My second impression was that someone at Olympus had been reading my letters and made me a camera. I've often said that the Micro Four Thirds body I wanted was an Olympus Sonic or a Pan Ollie. Well, this is an Olympus Sonic. What do I mean by that? I mean that three of the things I miss on my Panasonic bodies when using Olympus have been added. We have an articulated monitor, an electronic shutter, and something I understood was not possible, high bitrate video on a state-of-the-art stabilised sensor. Let's take a look. The EM5 is a similar size overall to Panasonic's GX7, but a little taller because of the EVF housing, and somewhat smaller than the Olympus EM1. The top is densely packed with dials, buttons and wheels, and the rear is dominated by the now fully articulated monitor. While there is no spare space, the back is not as closely packed with controls to the top, and Olympus have made space for a thoughtfully designed thumb rest. That, in conjunction with the contemporary looking sculpted front grip, makes the camera feel bigger than its dimensions suggest. The monitor is big, bright and clear, and as well as being articulated, can fold out of the way face into the body, safe from scratching, a la Panasonic G models. It doesn't sound a big thing, but you carry a camera more of the time than you use it, and simply eliminating such a cause for concern adds more to the camera's overall appeal than you might think. The EVF, I can only say that it's big, bright, crisp and a pleasure to use, and what's more is easily viewable corner to corner even when wearing glasses. I've never used better, and that includes full frame DSLRs. There's no built in flash, but a stubby little accessory unit is supplied which handily swivels, so that output can be bounced off side walls or ceilings. It's not particularly powerful, but the standard shoe can take bigger guns, and the camera is fully TTL flash compliant, so it can remotely control most others. If you're not going to have a built in flash, this is the way not to have it. The menu system now has a recall setting. So if you're trying out settings, you can return immediately to the same position, instead of wading through the menus every time. Given more than 110 items in the custom menu alone, that is a real time saver. And, as I mentioned, decent video. Not 4K, and not ultra specialised stuff for dyed in the wool video enthusiasts, but video to satisfy the rest of us. For my part, I can now shoot the same FHD 1920x1080 pixel video at a 50 bit per second data rate, that I do on my Panasonics. That's why I call it Olympusonic. Silent shutter, articulated screen, quality video, but bundled up with Olympus's trump card, the superb five-way stabilization system. How is it in use? First, the bad news. The size of the body and the densely packed controls gave me a problem. The four-way arrow pad on the rear of the camera is by default set to choose the autofocus target area. The fleshy part of my right hand kept shifting the target area all over the place. The solution was to disable it. The second and worst bit of bad news is the front dial which by default is set to dial in exposure compensation in my preferred aperture priority shooting mode. The dial protrudes too much and turns too easily and I found I was constantly dialing in unwanted compensation meaning I had to check the setting every time I brought the camera up to my eye. Very unsettling. You can't disable the front dial, so I set it to control the aperture instead. That way, if I jog it, at least the exposure will remain correct, even if not at my chosen aperture. I had a similar annoyance with the 4-way pad on my GX7, and while not crucial, they do detract from the shooting experience compared to bigger cameras like the GH4 or EM1. Thirdly, the menu system is a bit overcomplicated and quirky. It's perfectly usable, but with a steeper learning curve than necessary. Apart from that, the little Olympus is a joy to use. It feels great with small primes and big zooms. I thought the 40 to 150 f2.8 would be unbalanced with such a small camera, but in reality the thumb and four body grips, plus the tripod mount of the lens, yield a very user-friendly experience. The camera is well suited to smaller lenses, of course, 
from the Panasonic 12 to 32 through the 17 mm f1.8 to the 12 to 40 f2.8 zoom. So how is the M5 Mark II in use? Lightning quick autofocus is a given on these latest Micro Four Thirds cameras, and if there is any difference between them, it's pretty academic. Even if you put a GH4, EM1 and EM5 Mark II side by side with identical lenses, I doubt you'd perceive any real world advantage in any of them. Or any DSLR for that matter. Predictive continuous autofocus is good, but as with other MFT cameras, it is not up to the very best DSLRs. That's a fact of the contrast focusing method of Micro Four Third cameras, although I have to say that the EM1 with the firmware 3 upgrade to its on sensor phase detection is getting there. Here's a comparison using the 40 150 zoom at 100mm, f4, L sequence setting of 6.5 frames per second for the EM1 and 5 frames per second for the EM5. What is apparent is that the EM1 has more stamina than the EM5. The EM5 manages 29 frames with focus going right off for the last frames. The M1 manages 34 frames and retains focus all the way. These are quite startling results and tell you not only that the M5 performs very, very well, but that it is not far behind the M1 for follow focusing the best in MFT. I did find that occasionally in single autofocus, the M5 Mark II just wouldn't lock on to a perfectly normal subject and would seem to have focused while being resolutely off focus in the viewfinder. It always settled after a half a dozen retries, but it's disconcerting if you want to make a grab shot. High ISO noise is nicely controlled and once again there is little between all the latest MFT cameras. Although I shoot RAW as a rule, the M5's JPEG output is very pleasing. I still prefer my own JPEG output, but if you don't want all that trouble, you won't lose much ultimate image quality, and the JPEG output itself can be widely tweaked to your preferences. The electronic shutter gives you silent operation if you want it. And there is an anti-shock mode which utilises an electronic first shutter and operates up to 1 320th of a second. Shutter shock, a double image effect, which looks like fuzziness, can be an issue with any Micro Four Thirds camera, and DSLRs for that matter, at low to medium shutter speeds. And it is pleasing that Olympus listened and provided a remedy. Speaking of the shutter, the M5 standard shutter has a very pleasing sound. Most MFT cameras, to my ears, have a rather unpleasant shutter clack clack clack. Here's a GX7, here's the M1, and here's the M5. Lovely and soft and feathery. It may seem trivial, but just as someone chewing gum loudly can spoil a train journey, so can an unpleasant shutter sound take the edge off the enjoyment of a camera. The crowning glory of the M5 Mark II is its stabilisation. Calling it stabilisation is to sell it short. It's more like a gyroscopic mount. I have and always have had horribly shaky hands. It's a family trait. The M5 is a minor miracle. Using the 150mm zoom at max, handheld and unsupported, I can shoot with confidence at 1 30th of a second, and with some expectation of sharpness even at 1 15th. When you half press the shutter and the stabilisation takes effect, it's as if some giant invisible clamp has locked your subject matter down. Is it better than the M1? I'd say it is, to the point where I seriously wonder if I need to take a tripod at all on out and about shoots. There's an interesting high resolution setting which adds detail by shifting the sensor and gives a 40 megapixel JPEG. It needs a solid tripod and a static subject. And whilst it looks like a solution in search of a problem to me, I could see it being invaluable to some specialist photographers, product shots and food coming to mind. One thing that occurs to me is that it combines the file size of a medium format camera with the depth of field of a micro four thirds lens, which could be very handy. There's focus peaking with the choice of colours. And there's an unusually natural looking high dynamic range option. There are some fun artefacts. The diorama on video is one of mine. When I saw quick sleep mode on the menu, I thought it would just play a slideshow of my pictures. But it turns out that it has a double function. One is to almost double the battery life, putting the camera to sleep almost as soon as you take it from your eye. The other is to drive you mad. Seriously, all in all, the M5 Mark II has a blend of features unmatched by any previous cameras. 
Leaving aside the Panasonic GH4's astonishing but very specialist video capabilities, I can't think of anything that is missing from this camera. It's all underpinned by what must be the most effective stabilisation system in photography. For me, that alone, combined with up-to-date video capability, makes this camera a compelling buy and the most complete micro four-thirds camera made so far. I have the one big caveat, however. By packing so much physical control onto the body via buttons, levers and dials, Olympus have made the handling a bit too much like a mobile phone, in that you handle it gingerly in case you accidentally touch something and send your carefully selected settings haywire. It makes you feel insecure. Just look at the hardware on the top plate here, compared with the ergonomically much better Panasonic GX7. The front body button and dial and rear arrow pad are all vulnerable even to smallish hands like mine. The M5 Mark II sibling, the M1, is much nicer to use, mainly because the larger body means less overcrowding of the controls. That's an observation laced with personal opinion of course, but I would definitely advise trying an M5 Mark II before buying one, especially if you have big hands. For me, my reservations about the camera handling are trounced by the capabilities. I now have my Olympus Sonic. Next, I want an Oli Oli. This will be an EM1 body with swivel monitor and EM5 Mark II internals. Thanks for watching.